Welcome everybody. My name is Michelle Diaz. I'm the Education Program Manager at Trees Atlanta. Thank you for joining us today for our speaker series. Our mission at Trees Atlanta is to protect and improve Atlanta's urban forests by planting, conserving, and educating. We offer education programs like this year round, so I hope you can join us for other classes too. Today, our speaker is Kate McAlpin. She is the executive director at Woodlands Garden. And if you would like to share any question with her, she will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. And you can submit the questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the window. And after this event, you will be receiving a survey email. We will love your feedback. Um, and we would love to know how we can improve your experience as we are exploring more into the virtual classroom options. And to please follow up on social media and sign up to our newsletter so you can get more information about some other classes that we will be offering coming up. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Kate. Hi. Yeah, hi Kate, thank do... you for joining. Thanks for having me. Am I ready to do screen sharing? Yes. Okay. There you go. Does that look good? Is it up and running? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was really excited when Michelle contacted me. Feels like a long time ago um, to to lead a presentation. Um, and so we kind of settled on this topic and I'll share a little bit of um, what I learned in this process throughout the presentation. Um, so thank you so much for contacting me and I hope that everyone enjoys getting a little glimpse of what's going on over at Woodlands Garden and learns a little about some plant materials, specifically evergreens that we have thriving at Woodlands. Sorry about that, <laughs> a little technical difficulty. Um, that, that's not a good omen on slide one. Um, but I just wanted to share, I have, as Michelle mentioned, I was um, in the bio that I shared, I was previously in a very similar position to what Michelle does with Trees Atlanta. And I worked in an education coordinator capacity. And um, I just think it's interesting how large of a, metro Atlanta area is, but we've got great green spaces and it's a wonderful community to keep in touch. And, you know, I work with volunteers in the same capacity as I did at Trees Atlanta with, though we have different missions as organizations, but it's just a great community, a tight knit community of um, horticulture and green spaces in Atlanta. So I'm so glad that we can all keep in touch. And even in these difficult times, we can share and, you know, have these, these kinds of interactive professional development efforts. So um, look forward to more collaborations and getting back to life as we know it eventually. And just to give you a little lowdown on how I kind of broke up this presentation, I'd like to share a little bit with you about what Woodlands is all about, how this place is going from a private residence to a public garden that's open to all of you. Um, I also want to share some of the progress of our capital campaign construction. It's been really exciting times at Woodlands for the last five or so years. Um, and so we're really excited to share this next step of our story. And as any presentation about evergreens or 
horticulture, we're definitely going to dive into the plants, plants, plants um, as we move into the last phase of my presentation. So let's learn a little about what Woodlands is all about. Um, as you all know, we are located in the southeast area of the United States where that bright orange X is in the state of Georgia. Um, that's where Woodlands is located, I should say. Um, and we're just east of Atlanta in Decatur. Many of you are probably familiar with the Atlanta History Center and the Botanical Gardens, as well as the Beltline and the Atlanta Beltline Arboretum that um, Trees Atlanta oversees. And Woodlands is just down the road in Decatur at the corner of Scott and Claremont. Here's a little bit of a map that gives you an overview of how to get to Woodlands from Trees Atlanta. So we are not that far, just right down Ponce as you head east towards Decatur. And we are at the intersection here of um, Scott and Claremont as you're heading out of the city of Atlanta. Um, as you can see from the map, we are, the map on the left shows you sort of the boundaries of the eight acres of Woodlands Garden. And the visual on the right, that overview map, um, shows you a little bit more of the green space and, and how the tree canopy is continuous um, and just a little glimpse of what that green space looks like at the busy intersection of Scott and Claremont. So you can gain a little more perspective. This next slide zooms out some. Um, and what I find particularly interesting is where you see the little blue suitcase arrow. Um, that is Woodlands right there at the corner of Scott and Claremont. So just behind that blue dot, the rest of that shows you the eight acres of Woodlands. And that's just a nice patch of green space. Um, what I find interesting about this visual is how much development, residential, um, you know, the um, different types of residential, mixed use, um, and all of the growth that has happened and sprung up right around this area where Woodlands is located. Um, I think it's really interesting to point out that right there at that intersection of Scott and Claremont, those are two state highways that come together and there are at least 44,000 cars that travel through that intersection in a day. That is an old statistic. Um, so I'm sure that that number's only increased though I bet with the pandemic, it's, it's changed somewhat. Um, but just keep that in mind as we learn a little bit about the background of Woodlands that this area of Decatur has seen a lot of growth and a lot of changes um, since its beginnings as a private residence. The mission of Woodlands as a nonprofit organization is to preserve the Woodland Garden as an urban sanctuary with an effort to educate and engage the community in the natural world. So with this being said, we focus a lot on Georgia Piedmont native plants. Um, some, some great images here of some native plants that you might see at Woodlands if you visit more in the springtime. Um, these are not the ones we're gonna focus on this evening, but I just wanted to share a little um, visual of what you could expect the, of our plant palette that we focus on. But so our mission, just like with Trees Atlanta, helps steer us in the direction that we should be going um, as staff, as volunteers, as a board. So it's always nice to kind of reflect on that and share with everyone the, the mission that helps to guide us as an organization. And part of a mission, the, the way that that really comes together is with a vision. Um, and Woodlands has a very unique history and a very unique vision that actually came together many years ago as the, the eight acres were a private residence. Here you see Jean and Chet Morse. They moved to the property in 1946 and they actually built this home that you see there on the right with the golf cart in front. Um, that cinder block building was actually built by Mrs. Morse's father, who was a bridge builder in the state of Georgia. So it is built like a bridge. It's very substantial, it's a cinder block structure. And we now use that as our visitor center. And the family lived 
as I said, starting in, in the mid forties, they moved to the Decatur area and they grew out of this home and built another home on the property. They acquired another parcel of property and pulled together seven acres, which was their private residence for years. They had four children and many, many grandchildren. And this couple was approached, as you may imagine, by many developers and had lots of opportunity um, to pass on the seven acres that they had so lovingly cared for and, and raised children in and grandchildren. They had many opportunities to sell off these parcels of property to developers for townhomes or, or any other you know, type of development that you could imagine. But they were very, very forward thinking. They knew that the, this piece of green space that they had so lovingly taken care of over the years that it is just so incredibly important. And they knew that it was gonna be incredibly important for future generations. They'd spent years and years developing um, trails and taking care of what they called the honeysuckle jungle um, that was a part of this property when they first moved there. And you have to remember that um, they moved there to this area of Decatur back when Scott Boulevard was a dirt road. So they saw so many incredible changes, but they knew as a family that they wanted this parcel of property to be maintained as a public green space for forever. Um, and so that's kind of one of my little play on words with the title of this presentation, that this is uh, forever green. Um, because this space in Decatur will be forever a green space because of the forward thinking that the Morse family put into place in early 2000. Even before they were no longer living on the property, Dr. and Mrs. Morse had professional landscape architects visit the property and help provide ideas and input as to how the space could be transitioned into a public garden. And one of the things that needed to happen was to be able to get people on site safely. And so um, they needed to develop a, a more accessible parking area. And so here you can see the really unique way to remove trees of having these horses carry out the, the lumber that was salvaged and um, you know, take these off site without uh, impacting the rest of the precious green space. And so they took these steps to work towards getting the public on site. Um, so they really were, were thinking, thinking ahead as to how to, how to make this a, a spot for the community. And what we think of today, now that we have become a 501c3. We have a board of up to 15 members at any given time. Um, we have a small staff, myself as the executive director and Julia Bryant as our garden manager. Um, we see programming that actually brings visitors from the neighboring um, neighborhoods and from other partner organizations to come listen to music. We have a great event every fall and a lot of these things are outside the pandemic. So please join in on our newsletter and visit our website and social media so you can see as we get these things back online when it's appropriate. Um, but these are kind of our bread and butter events, having music, having kids and families interact with nature during our fairies in the garden event, which is hugely popular. Um, interacting with large volunteer groups and having corporate days. Um, and you can see in the bottom right, we did actually pull off a socially distanced outdoor board retreat this year because we're in the midst of a large strategic planning process. So there's a lot going on. We are, we are actively moving from that private residence into the public green space, public garden. Um, and it's a very exciting time and has been at Woodlands. Um, one of the components of being a public green space that we feel is, is at the core of our garden is working with volunteers. As a small staff, as I mentioned, it's myself and a part-time garden manager to manage the eight acres. Um, so we work incredibly 
close with volunteers. And we here you see some images from the last eight months where we've actually have had active volunteer days where volunteers are more than happy to get out in this green space and be able to give back, pulling weeds, helping with the socially distanced plant sale, mulching the trails and all while wearing a mask and you know taking all the necessary precautions. So volunteers are certainly the lifeblood of this organization and they help us accomplish most anything that is related to the mission. And then what has been going on at Woodlands over the last five years or so? We've, we've been deep in the trenches with capital campaign and capital campaign construction. Um, and this has been quite the process. As I mentioned, we're a small organization. We currently have a board of 14 members. Um, and there was a time that the garden was seven acres and still needed to get into updating the master plan and figuring out what are the next steps with raising funds to move forward with capital campaign construction. And the board was just really, you know, gung ho and on top of getting a worthwhile master plan together. Um, you can see the visual on the left is our older garden map. And then the arrow carries you over to our first master plan, which was all well and good. It had a lot of wonderful features that was going to help the garden be more accessible. Um, it was going to help the garden to uh, feature more plant material on the lawn and provide pollinator plantings and fountains and just, you know, wonderful, wonderful features. And you may have heard me mention seven acres as well as eight acres. There's a little bit of uh, chronologically, the garden has gone from seven acres to eight acres. When you look at the bottom right diagram, the black and white diagram, you see an extra square on the corner at Scott and Claremont. And that is because one, a one acre parcel went up for sale just as the board was wrapping up the master planning process. Um, and so thankfully the board kind of took a step back and they said, you know what, we've got to think about this strategically. If we are looking at increasing parking and getting visitors off of Scott Boulevard safely and interacting, you know, getting them into the garden um, with a nice visitor experience, we should seriously think about what we need to do to adjust our capital campaign goal to actually purchase that corner property. Um, and so they kind of, it was like one step forward, three steps back, and now they're adjusting the master plan. Luckily, throughout this whole process, we worked with TSW here in Atlanta as an architect firm, and they were more than happy, you know, to kind of work with us, knowing that this was really a strategic um, move. And so thankfully, the, the fundraising goal was able to be adjusted. We got the support from the city of Decatur um, to be able to actually purchase that parcel of property from the city, repay them for that purchase um, and acquire that corner parcel that was directly adjacent to the garden. So then we were able to pull out the parking from the seven acres of the original garden and move that parking up onto that corner parcel, which allowed us to even further our mission of conserving and preserving the woodland garden um, because we were able to keep that continuous woodland and move the parking that the garden so desperately needed up to the corner parcel. Um, and so that's probably if you've driven by in the last year or two, um, that's where you've seen a lot of movement and things going on um, because we purchased that corner. And so in turn, we had to totally readjust our master plan, which was where you get to the next arrow. And then we flipped to the next page and we went through um, a few different renditions of a landscape plan. You know, how could we really hone in on doing what we needed to do in this corner parcel um, knowing 
that we were going to be able to shift the parking up to the corner, less impact on the greater garden. And then also within this transition, I missed a big piece here. Also within this transition from one master plan, including the corner parcel, we were able to get budget numbers back um, and really dig deeper into what the construction costs were gonna be. And it was quite substantially more than what we had fundraised for. Um, so we had successfully fundraised a million dollars, which we were thrilled about um, a little over a million dollars. That was a huge feather in our cap, but it didn't get us into the far reaches of the master plan that we had hoped for. So we worked with TSW yet again to kind of hone in on the corner property. We realized that what we really needed to do to make our money stretch as far as we needed it to, um, what we really needed to do was zero in on this one acre that we had purchased um, and figure out how can we use this space most efficiently to get visitors on site safely, route them up to a very much needed parking area, and also integrate new ADA accessibility. And let's plant some pollinator gardens. Let's plant some native plants and feature some sun loving plant material on the corner property that we haven't been able to feature in the woodland garden because it's so shady. Um, so we, you know, went through our renditions with landscape plans, ended up with this amazing plan that we have now completed um, that Steve Sanchez thankfully jumped in and helped us. Um, he is very involved with Trees Atlanta. That's how I first met him. But he is a native plant guru. If you'd ever like to talk oaks for 30 minutes, don't call him. But if you'd like to talk for an hour and 30 minutes, call him. Um, but Steve is a, a local landscape architect with HGOR and he is very well versed in all things native plants. And he said, you know what you need to do? You need to feature a palette, a palette of native Piedmont plants that you haven't been able to utilize in the rest of Woodlands. And I think you should really, really acknowledge upper Piedmont native plants. Um, the, the Upper Ridge Piedmont plantings. So that's what we did. We focused on plants that would thrive in this area. Um, I'm going to feature a number of them this evening as we get into some of the evergreens. But here you see something that's not evergreen, like the strawberry bush, um, which we have a lot of out, at, out in the garden as well. Um, but up here on the corner, it's, um, you know, another great feature for us to be able to include in this planting. So we're thrilled with the landscape plan. We're thrilled that we zeroed in on what we really needed to do to get woodlands to be more publicly accessible. And as I mentioned, we, work with T we worked with TSW. They helped us with the design. Um, we had great renderings, which um, you know, after you get into the process of really figuring out what's realistic, um, what your needs are, and what you can what you can actually accomplish on site, some things don't always turn out quite like the picture. Um, but we hope, as the trees grow and mature, that this will be sort of a, a similar feel that you'll get as you come into the parking area of Woodlands. They also did some computer generated renderings, which is really cool to see. Um, this is a serpentine path that we have installed that goes from the visitor center out into the garden. Um, doesn't maybe look quite this lush at this time, um, but it's always exciting to have a visual like this to see what's to come um, and, and just all of the possibilities that we'll have as, as all of the, the hardscape and the construction and all of this wraps up. We're excited to see these types of plant material um, thrive and, and you know, kind of show off all of their exciting attributes. And then once the design was all wrapped up and, and ready to roll, we brought Gay Construction on site and they helped us with the process of um, 
grading, which was a huge feat in this space. The corner property, which is just up behind the visitor center that you see in the panoramic video and or video, the panoramic picture in the bottom, um, that's our visitor center that I mentioned the Morse family originally built on the property in 46. Um, but just beyond that is the corner property that we purchased. And this isn't, it's not an, ex, you know, you can even tell from this panoramic image that it is, it's quite an extreme slope from the visitor center down to where the photographer is standing. But if you can imagine that even beyond that in the parcel at the corner, that three to four feet at any point had to be brought down, the, the grade had to be brought down three to four feet to get everything at the right level for school bus accessibility, for us to have ADA accessibility, um, to be able to have fire trucks on and off site safely. There was a substantial amount of grading that had to be done. So this was a, a pretty big undertaking just to get the land situated. Um, and so this all started back in March of 2019. And we were told that it was a six to nine month construction project. And um, as it stands today, we are currently open to walk-in visitors, but the garden is not officially reopened to vehicles just yet. Um, we have a little bit of work we're still wrapping up with Gay in terms of, of drainage. Um, but we are hopeful to be have that all completed within the next couple of weeks. So, but a big chunk of work just starting out getting the site ready. And here are some great before and afters that hopefully, if you haven't visited Woodlands, will help you see what we did and why it was so necessary. Um, on the left is the before image of the slope down into the garden from the visitor center. It was quite substantial. Um, there was no way that you were going to safely even push a, a baby stroller down this slope without um, you know, a few hands to help you out. So as you can see, you'll hear a common thread of the need for accessibility throughout the presentation. And the serpentine path, as we are calling it on the right, is our solution for this really intense slope as you leave the visitor center. Uh, we're now calling the Morse family home that we use as our office and our restrooms and our program space, we call it the visitor center. So going from the visitor center down into the garden, you can now take the meandering serpentine path. Um, and it's really a fun experience. And if you remember the computer generated image, there is a lot of, of plant material to grow in and thrive, but that's the beauty of a garden is to come back season after season and see things change. and even since this picture, um, things have grown in and are thriving. Um, so accessibility is major, major changes on, in the visitor center from what it was before and what we're seeing today with the serpentine path. I don't have a before picture of our parking because it was really non-existent. Um, we had a few spaces within the garden and what we have ended up with now is roughly 30 spaces up at the corner property with bioretention swales in the middle of each of the parking, each of the bays of parking. Um, and these bioretention areas will actually absorb runoff and help the, the storm water naturally percolate back into the earth. So a little different than the rendering that TSW initially supplied us with but we're excited to see this really nice sustainable um, planting option. It, really excited to see how this works for us. Um, but the parking is a major update from what we've had before. It's very visually appealing. It's easy to find. You kind of know where to go, whereas before there may have been a little confusion. Um, I'll show a couple of images of that shortly. Um, 
our visitors really will now see the the structure that's on site as a visitor center. Um, it's much more welcoming. It got a fresh coat of paint, a fresh new door color, so that you can really tell where to go and feel comfortable entering and accessing um, the amenities. As you can see, we were able to install a wheelchair ramp, which is really amazing on the side of the visitor center and extend the deck area so that we can even organize gatherings that you know may take advantage of this outdoor space outside of the visitor center. So visitor access is a, a key point of our capital campaign. Um, and then safety, as I mentioned, the entrance off of Scott was really not all that welcoming. So what you see on the left is the before and what we have now is a very clear visual of where to go when you enter. Um, so in the cute little visitor center off in the distance draws your eye as you enter in off of Scott. Um, and so that's kind of wrapping up the, the construction side of things and what's been happening at Woodlands over the last couple of years. Um, and I encourage you all to join in on our e-newsletter to hear more about how we're opening the gates again and getting everyone back on site to volunteer and visit. Um, but what we're really here for are the plants, plants, plants. Um, and I have to say, when I initially talked with Michelle about this presentation many months ago, um, I offered up the idea of evergreens, though I really had no um, strong connection or like very much knowledge, or I didn't feel like I had much knowledge about evergreens. Um, and just to, you know, bring in a, a cute little baby, I, I think of things now, um, having had a, a little one, I think of things from her perspective. And so she really, you know, kind of makes me look at visiting the garden in a different way. And I'm thankful for Michelle because she made me think about evergreens and looking at woodlands in a different perspective. Um, so I'm really excited to share some of these evergreen um, plants that you'll see thriving at woodlands. And I should mention that there's also some that are not evergreen, but are more of seasonal interest. Um, so at Woodlands, we have a couple of different areas, one that focuses more on historic gardens, things that Dr. Morse uh, planted and cultivated when he lived at the garden, and then also an area in the, um, in the native cult of um, the, the native garden that we call the Georgia Piedmont garden. Um, so we get an opportunity to play with native and non-native species, which is a lot of fun. Um, and so you'll see a little bit of a mix of both of those in this presentation. But starting out with some seasonal interest, not necessarily evergreen and some recent plantings that we've installed on the corner. Um, I've been really excited about the seasonal interest of grasses. Um, these, these couple of different options that you see here, a switch, switch grass and the silk grass are really showing a lot of great movement and texture in the garden. And I think it's just, it's really important to incorporate a number of different levels of plants. Um, so we're starting kind of low here with these grasses, but a lot of good seasonal, um, the, the seed heads there are left on the switchgrass. And this actually is the backside of Scott Boulevard. Um, so it's a nice mass of grasses right there as you pass by on Scott Boulevard. And that's kind of, it's nice to have a, a textured swath um, as you're passing by, but also very fun to integrate into your home landscape too. And here's another switchgrass planted in the bioretention swale in the parking area. And then the mountain mint that this is actually not a super recent photo. The mountain mint is kind of turning um, colors and, and it's still thriving on the, on the bank there. But just another kind of seasonal interest that you can't always just think about the 
the hollies and the, the standard evergreens this time of year. There are so many plants that make a winter garden um, exciting and, and fun to see change in every season. So don't forget about the different grasses and the perennials too that are, are doing cool things out there right now. This is sort of a, a fun, a fun little guy that we decided to leave out on the corner. This yucca was actually existing. Um, it was a, a plant that was just thriving out on the corner and we decided to just integrate it into the planting palette and leave it out there because it's in some very tough areas on the hillside, um, but it'll stay green and it'll provide this spiky texture year round, um, even blooms randomly in the summer. Um, but yucca is a great kind of um, adds a whole different dimension. Or you can think about muley grass. It's a nice soft texture. Again, not necessarily something you'd think of as an evergreen, but it's, it's great winter interest this time of year. And just like the switchgrass that I showed before, this is right along Scott Boulevard. So next time you drive by, you can't miss it. There's really cool plumes and plumes of, of white cloud muley grass out there. Um, and it swishes so nicely in the breeze. So something definitely to consider for your home landscape. A couple of more seasonal interest things that are changing color right now, like the sparkleberry and the sourwood, um, lots of great leaf color changes going on out there in the in the landscape. And these are the sparkleberry is more of a shrub and the sourwood you would think of in a tree form. Um, but certainly great natives that would could find a place in your home landscape. And I have a feeling that the Trees Atlanta tree sale definitely sold sourwood, but I bet you could have also found sparkleberry there. And if people do have questions about availability of these items, that's another arena that Steve Sanchez was able to really direct us to find where you can where can you find these native plants? Sometimes that's part of the issue um, is being able to source a, a very particular native plant, but he has a great handle on that and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction with which nurseries to reach out to. So here are a couple of the more standard evergreens that we might typically think of. Um, as I started looking specifically at the evergreens at Woodlands, it really got me thinking about why do we use evergreens? Um, you know, some of the, the images I've already shared, they're beautiful, they have nice color, they offer a, a seasonal interest when there's not a whole lot else going on in the landscape. Um, but here is a perfect example of where we've used two different types of evergreen trees. Um, in the foreground, you can see an American holly, which is the Satter Hill variety. And then in the background, those two more fluffy evergreens are shortleaf pines. And we used these in the landscape more as a screen. Um, you can see to the far left that there's a house under construction. That was a home that was a part of the corner parcel that Woodlands bought with the capital campaign. And we've actually sold that to another nonprofit, L'Arche Atlanta. Um, I encourage you to look into L'Arche Atlanta, learn a little about their mission. We are thrilled to have them as neighbors, um, but we also did want to have a little bit of a screen to protect um, the, the view shed from our parking area into this residence because it will be a home that's lived in um, year round. So we wanted to be sure that there was a nice screen. So this is a, a perfect area where you'd use an evergreen as a barrier. Um, I have to assume that Steve selected the Satter Hill American Holly as a really great Piedmont um, native option because of those really striking berries. But don't forget that hollies are dioecious, which means that you need a male and a female to be able to produce the berries. Um, so you can see that um, in this picture on the left, the one closest to us is, has the really striking red berries and the one behind it isn't full of those berries quite as much. 
Here's another great image on the right of the Satter Hill American Holly. It has really, really great leaves, nice and shiny, and you know, kind of gives you that typical holly look. Nice reflection, as you can see in the image, glossy leaves and the, the big fat berries. Um, I was really impressed when I went up to the red sprite winterberry that is located in the bioretention. I was really impressed with just how inundated it is with berries. Again, we have a male and female planted in this bioretention area. Um, but these little guys look like they are thriving and they're just going to take off. Um, so since they're planted in a bioretention area, you can go ahead and assume that they're okay with having a little bit wet feet. Um, and they seem to be doing really well. And I can't wait to see how this area just offers more and more winter interest. And that switchgrass that I showed in a previous image is just behind that red sprite. And here is probably another fairly standard native that you might think of, the Eastern Red Cedar. This is the cultivar Brody. Um, it's nice up on top of a ridge. Again, provides a really good screen, a barrier between our parking and Scott Boulevard. We wanted to be sure um, that we were being not only cognizant of what happened within the Woodlands property, but we also wanted to be respectful of our neighbors, um, the people that live out in the community, the cars that drive by. We wanted to do our best to screen the cars that will be parking at Woodlands. So having something like an Eastern Red Cedar up along the top of that ridge at Scott was the was the perfect option. Um, it's gonna get nice and full and just love that evergreen needle that it produces. And as we move into the driveway that's just been installed at Scott Boulevard, you can see this is sort of a precarious location. So we selected a plant that's really gonna, going to thrive in a tough area. This is a John's wort, it's called sunburst. So I'm assuming we're gonna see some really great sunburst yellow blooms on it. Um, but this is maybe, again, not something you'd think of as an evergreen, but it's going to keep its leaves and provide winter interest. Um, really great for arrangements. That's another like level of beauty that maybe you don't think of with evergreens. Um, and so it's going to handle this really tough growing situation and thrive right here up um, right by the sidewalk at Scott. You can see that sweet little visitor center in the back that is just going to draw people in, hopefully. And I unfortunately didn't get a really great picture of this Maryland Dwarf American Holly, but you can kind of see why you might select it for the landscape in these two pictures. Um, the one on the left is the entrance from Scott. And the one on the right is just kind of the edge of the serpentine path as it leaves the visitor center. And these are both areas where, you know, you want, you want to have something growing that's going to thrive in sort of a, a funny spot, but stay low. Um, so this American holly really will do just that. It'll stay low, may have some berries. Um, but not berries like the Satter Hill option that I showed earlier. These, this is more of a, of a, a holly that you would select for its low growing, um, uh, low growing properties. Um, so really cool. I mean, this is this is going to be really a hard working plant for us because we aren't quite sure where people are. People are probably going to make um, paths, you know, as footpaths to get from the shortest point from point A to point, point B. So having a shrub like this that kind of deters people from just walking all across the ground is really important in this application. 
And then as we move away from the new plantings on the corner and into the rest of the garden, we have a number of Southern Magnolias. And Southern Magnolia isn't necessarily in the Piedmont, um, the, the Piedmont plant palette. It's more of a Southern um, kind of a coastal, coastal plain tree, but we actually have kind of made an addendum to our planting policy that allows us to keep the Southern Magnolia because it is such a great screening tree. The image on the right of how it kind of shoots up and sends up sprouts um, right, out of the, right out of the ground or right out of suckers, um, it really can help to screen. And as you may recall from the, the different pictures of the maps of where Woodlands is located, we have neighbors, private residences, condo associations, um, multifamily homes all around the garden. So it's really important for us to screen the garden so that we can really have a, a more appealing visitor experience. So having a plant like the Southern Magnolia that sprouts up and kind of almost grows like in groves, it's, it really is the, the perfect screen for us at Woodlands. And this is kind of another um, uh, sort of a, a um, spot in our planting policy that we've allowed a little bit of wiggle room. Um, this is a really cool path that takes you to the pavilion, which is the screened in structure in the garden where we host music in the garden and there's a wood burning fireplace. It's a really great atmosphere. And so as you kind of meander down the path, you come up to this tulip poplar that we had to have remove, had to have removed, um, and luckily the arborists were able to make it fall in such a way that it landed right along the path. So kids love to walk on it. It's a really great spot for just sitting and enjoying. But what you don't see is that directly behind the log, there's a nice evergreen hedge, and um, our neighbors. So this evergreen hedge is an Akuba, which is completely non-native, um, but we are okay with it in this application because it, again, gives a really natural screen, which, you know, if you were walking on this path to the pavilion to say a five-year-old's birthday party, you, and the Akuba wasn't there, you would be distracted and looking over at our neighbor's property where they're having a pool party. Um, but since this screen is there, you really don't even look over that way. You know, you might be more attracted to the calycanthus that's over on the right side with the blooms or the seed pods that are happening in that season. So we use uh, evergreen barriers um, not only as a screen, but also kind of a distraction so that visitors will turn and look at something else um, because it's pretty much just a mass of green. And so in, in this application, we're okay with the Akuba, even though it is not native. And we love our American holly. There's a lot of American holly in the garden. Um, and it, this is the perfect time of year to come visit to really appreciate what it does um, in the space. This is an amphitheater, which the Decatur Rotary installed many years ago. And the amphitheater is used as an outdoor classroom. It's been used as a wedding venue. And one of the the first landscape architects that the Morse family had on the property to provide his expertise was Edward Doherty. And he said, you know, if you are going to install an amphitheater where you want people to gather and feel enclosed in nature, I really encourage you to consider planting American holly. Um, and these American hollies, I was just hearing from the Morse family this week that these American hollies have just thrived in this location and they really help to provide and encapsulate a little room here when you're in the amphitheater. Again, male and female to produce the really great red berries, but it is just the perfect screen and enclosure for a space um, like an amphitheater. So maybe if you're trying to provide a little screening for like a meditation space or an outdoor kitchen, um, certainly consider the American Holly. 
We've got a great stand of Eastern hemlock. Um, we constantly scan them for hemlock woolly adelgid and we're not seeing any as of yet. Um, but these Eastern hemlock really, they drape over when you're walking on the path um, and they really kind of help provide such a nice soft canopy that really kind of sweeps right across your head at this point in the trail. And just a, a really great um, native and also just a great evergreen. And then as you move into the lawn space, we've got this really wacky Laura Petalum. You can't see it so well, the picture on the left, um, but the, the Laura Petalum is just be behind the circle of logs. Um, and it's evergreen. It is more commonly thought of as a standard landscape shrub, but in this application, we've let it grow and it has gone wild. Um, so certainly something you wanna come back and visit, but this is really cool for, um, not only is it evergreen and you see, you know, the, the great um, foliage up above, but the trunk has kind of intertwined in such a way that, that it in itself is also beautiful. So you can find some things that you might not really think of as, as moving into a tree form from a shrub form. Um, but in this way, it's kind of, it's unique. It has a story and it's, um, you know, a, a fun evergreen for us to feature in the landscape. And you can't really talk about evergreens without mentioning Osmanthus. The tea olive is such a sweet fragrant shrub. Um, this shrub has really, really grown and thrived and is much more of a tree. Um, I highly recommend this for planting near a, an entry or exit at your home, just so you smell it as you're coming and going. But this guy blooms multiple times a year. Um, there's a really amazing orange variety of osmanthus that you can also find. Um, so definitely grab that osmanthus next time you see it. And the traditional boxwood is always a favorite evergreen. I have actually used boxwood here to produce a wreath. So not only are evergreens great for screening and beauty out in the landscape, but bring them inside. You know, these pine cones that are produced by some pine tree are, um, you know, a natural element of the evergreen that you can certainly use as indoor decor as well. And don't forget about perennials like the Lenten rose that you see on the right. It's evergreen. It has great foliage that's good for um, bringing in for arrangements, but also will kind of carpet um, carpet your garden if you're interested in that. In a space where it will thrive, it will just go on and on as you see in the picture on the right. We love the, the little brown jug that pops up around the native areas at Woodlands. This is actually pollinated by ants. The ants will go in the little jug flowers and help to spread the seeds throughout the garden. Um, so it's a, a really great native. It has a, a beautiful heart-shaped glossy leaf and stays low to the ground. It similarly is low to the ground like our native Pachysandra. This is a plant that's very hard to find in the trade, but it is a much better alternative to the non-native Pachysandra that you can readily find most anywhere. Um, so be on the lookout for the native Pachysandra. It creeps and um, is a great low grower, but also has a really cool new growth. That's the new growth that's shooting up and a, a wonderful bloom as well. And we actually had to um, let go of a tree that came down during a windstorm that had this resurrection fern thriving on it. So of course we kept as many limbs of it as we could, um, but resurrection fern, if you happen to have some on your property is really cool to just, just watch how it unfurls and, and closes up with the rain and change in temperature a really amazing evergreen. And a couple other ferns just to round out that sort of um, 
more herbaceous layer is the Christmas fern, which I am not the best at fern identification, but I can identify a Christmas fern. One, because it's evergreen. And two, because someone told me that the little elements, the little leaflets in the frond, um, if you take them off, they look like a stocking. So like a Christmas stocking. Um, don't know if that's helpful, but it's always helped me. But so Christmas fern is out in all over woodlands um, and we really appreciate its properties and are, are really glad to see it stay around year round as an evergreen. It is native. However, this holly fern that you see on the right is not native. Um, it is evergreen and it's great for arrangements and it really gets more bulky and kind of chunky, um, but not a non-native option. So um, take that into consideration when you make that choice. And one of the last things we haven't talked about are blooms on evergreens. So here's a little feature of a couple of the camellias that we have thriving at Woodlands. Dr. Morse promised his wife that he'd have something happening and in bloom every season at their property. Um, so he cultivated and loved camellias. So we have an amazing camellia collection, um, over a hundred different species and a hundred different varieties. And we are on the American Camellia Trail and I encourage you to come visit. Right now is the perfect time to come see these guys. Um, and there's a lot of grafting going on just to be sure that we have a diverse collection. And they are an evergreen shrub with a beautiful bloom um, from now until in, into February. And I did see that there was a question that popped up about when is Woodlands open? Um, so we are currently open to walk-in visitors off of Scott Boulevard. And within a week, we should be reopened to all. We have a small um, drainage project that we have to complete um, this time next week. And then after that, we will be fully reopened um, and our policy is that we're open during daylight hours. We are a free public garden, um, but we do encourage people to come and visit and find a way to get involved, whether that means signing up for our e-newsletter, staying up to date with upcoming volunteer projects, because as I've mentioned many times, um, we really thrive because of the volunteers that, that help out in so many ways. And this time of year, we are always encouraging to donate and give back if you're able, um, because every amount helps. We are a nonprofit and the community support that we get from individuals through donations is what helps us, helps us do what we do. Um, and so that's, that's all I had. I, I would love to answer any questions. Um, if anyone has anything else, I would love to hear from you. Well, thank you so much, Kane. It was great um, to see all the photos and very excited to go visit the space when, when open to the public. Yes, yeah, we are so excited to get, um, to get people back on site and um, it's gonna be great to have visitors back and one day have programs again. Um, you know, I think we'll be able to figure out how to safely host garden tours, um, but having programs like fairies in the garden or music in the garden, we're gonna have to think on that a little bit. And, um, you know, we wanna be sure that, that we're doing things safely. Definitely, definitely. Well, I don't see any other questions, but um, if you have any, please feel free to send it to me and I'll share them with Kate. And well, thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.